Uh, this is how Britain works. Uh, we're the taxpayers. Uh, we pay our taxes, uh, and then uh, the civil servants, the top civil servants, basically it appears carve it up between themselves and pay themselves huge salaries uh, and then massive great bonuses. Uh, I'm not quite sure for what. Extraordinarily, it's just been revealed that a gaggle of Whitehall elites, uh, the top civil servants in Whitehall, have just shared out £400,000 worth of bonuses between them, uh, including uh, the Permanent Secretary of the Department for Culture, Media and Sports, Sarah Healy. Uh, She is the famous woman who said that she loves working from home uh, because it gives her more time to get onto her Peloton bike, uh, her exercise bike. Uh, She gets 170 grand a year and she's just picked up a £20,000 bonus uh, and uh, that is for working from home. Same goes uh, for uh, uh, what's his name? Philip Sidwell is it the uh, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, He has uh, he gets £250 £15,000 a year and he too has, it's Mark, sorry, Sir Mark said well, he gets uh, £215,000 a year as Cabinet Secretary, he's just also got a £20,000 a year uh, bonus I would imagine as Cabinet Secretary he might at least have had to have gone into work I'm sure he has, but Sarah Healy has been uh, uh, relishing not having to go to work uh, so have many of these other top civil servants who've all got uh, massive Massive great bonuses. Uh, what are they? What are these bonuses for? Uh, the government says it is right that staff are rewarded for hard work when they demonstrate high level performance. What does that mean? A high level performance on a peloton bike? It's getting really good scores or something? It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. These people are paid too much in the first place, and now they're getting great big bonuses, and they're working from home. Is, this is, a, for my mind, this borders on corruption. Let's talk to the research director, director at the Taxpayers Alliance, Duncan Simpson. Uh, good evening, Duncan. Evening. This is extraordinary, isn't it? It is. Un- unfortunately, we do we do see this year after year. Um, civil servants are very top civil servants. The permanent secretaries like Sarah Healy, who runs a department, uh, not just them, but other senior civil servants who sort of run sort of sub-departments within them. It's very ordinary for them to get for them to get bonuses. Now, as you say, it's not entirely clear what this sort of high performance exactly is. Um, yes, they're big departments. They have to employ a lot of people. Of course, they need good practical skills to do that. I'm not saying they're lacking the ability. So I'm not saying that. But, you know, Let's look, let's look at the overall picture um, for civil servants. So we know that the pay premium, if you work at the public sector versus the private sector, is about 7%. So that's salary, pension, bonuses, and whatnot. Uh, you're much better off in the public sector. Um, in addition to that, well, specifically the pension schemes as well for quite a few civil servants are stupendous. So this guy called Simon McDonald, sorry, Lord McDonald now, who used to run the Foreign Office, his pension pot when he retired about 18 months ago was £2.2 million. Pounds. Uh, he's got a lump sum of almost 300k, he gets a yearly pension of about £90,000. There are many other civil servants who are recently retired or soon to be retired in that kind of position. So these guys are already in a particularly good position. And I think one of the arguments which the civil servants, the government might say in response to this is that, well, we need the best people. We need to attract the best people, retain the best people, because otherwise they would go into the private sector. I don't really buy that argument. I mean, ultimately, we're told that a lot of people would go into the civil service and public service more widely do this out of a sense of public duty. And I think that's that's obviously a very good reason to go and do that. And so necessarily the desire to have the very top pay packets compared to your mate who you left university with 30 years ago who might be earning half a million quid in the city as a lawyer, um, that kind of appeal just isn't there because you're there for a sense of good reasons to yeah, help the public and do what you can in that kind of job. So I, I just don't buy the kind of defence which the government puts out, uh, this government and previous government puts out to try and defend these kind of bonuses. Uh, it's a bit like the BBC, isn't it? The BBC pays its uh, alleged stars massive great amounts of money and executives because it says, oh, if we don't do this, they'll be poached by the private sector. The private sector mm. wouldn't come near to paying this amount of money that the BBC does. Uh, and I think that goes the same for the civil service. My dad was, God rest his soul, was uh, a, a sort of middle to high-ranking civil servant. And uh, the deal then in his day was this – 
You had a very secure job. He was never going to get laid off. Uh, and he had a really good pension deal, you know, finally, final salary pension deal. Uh, but the understanding was that his income was never anything like what people were earning in the private sector. When did that all die? When did uh, civil servants start paying themselves uh, massive amounts of money, more than the private sector? When did all this happen? Well, it's evolved, it's evolved over quite a few years. I mean, civil service pensions in particular, let's talk about that guy Simon Donald, uh, pensions in particular have, have been amazing for years. I mean, they're, they're less generous than they used to be, but uh, you're still looking at around about an employer contribution rate of pushing 20%. In the private sector, it's, it's way below that. So water enrollment, you've got about, I, I think it's sort of five, it's up to 5% employer contribution, 3% employee, Also, it can be larger than that. So there's numerous other benefits. Um, I, I think, to be honest, Governor, I mean, it just kind of speaks to the growth of the civil service. We know, for example, that the total number of civil servants increased by about 10% between 2020 and 2021. Now, a big part of the reason for that is because of COVID, you know, the Department of Health, for example, and employed a lot of other people on a temporary basis to deal with what was happening in the country a couple of years back. So there's some justification for that. But nevertheless, this is a big and growing industry, and, we, and that's been that's been the case for years and years. So unfortunately, it speaks to it speaks to an unwillingness for ministers of this government and previous governments of both parties to actually address the issue until they really grasp the nettle. I don't think that's unfortunately going to change. I think also fundamentally, you know ministers, even though it is in their power to fire senior civil servants or junior civil servants who mess up and uh, make huge screw-ups time and time again, they generally don't do that. I mean, one interesting idea that the government uh, might want to pursue is to make it much easier to to fire senior civil servants. For example, you know, a new minister could come into their department and say, you know, basically fire all the senior staff and make them reapply for their jobs and that would kind of reassert the position that will actually you know ministers and parliament are are actually in charge here and it's not civil servants who are running their own ideas and their own fiefdom and i think that would really well hopefully sort of uh, rein in some of the pretense um that quite a few of these senior senior staff and departments have I'm not pointing the finger at any uh, particular individual, even peloton riders, uh, because this is a, a culture that has increased over the years. Uh, but uh, and I don't think there's one single person who's responsible for it. But the way uh, they're being paid now and these bonuses, carving up taxpayers' money, uh, it borders on corruption, doesn't it? <sighs> I, th I think, unfortunately, it does increase it. I mean, so, so you know, the, the actual boring technical stuff, so there's one civil servant in the department, the permanent secretary, who is the accounting officer. So they sort of sign off the accounts, uh, sort of approve the accounts. That Look after audited. their mates, right? <laughs> exactly. So so in theory, and just in theory, Kevin, they're, they're responsible departments. So they'll have to go to a parliament, parliamentary committee, they'll have to explain them their, their actions, what they've messed up, what they've done well, and so on and so forth. But basically, everybody below that in a government department doesn't really have that kind of accountability. Now, obviously, they have to respond to their ministers and run errands for their ministers and actually do you know, delivery for them. But broadly speaking, there isn't a spotlight on good performance as well as bad performance. I think, as, as with many things in all areas of government spending and taxation that we, we look into, sunlight is the best system thank you. Without that kind of accountability, that kind of open accountability of what people are cocking up on a daily basis, right. we're not going to know exactly who is responsible for some, for some of the worst errors in our, in our civil service, unfortunately. Yeah, it's uh, it's extraordinary, isn't it? It's not like the civil service, uh, uh, you know, are sort of bastions of brilliance. Uh, they seem to, cut, <laughs> as you said, they screw up on a regular basis, but they're getting nicely uh, remunerated. Uh, good to talk to you, Duncan. Thank you very much for your time. That's uh, Duncan Simpson, Research Director at the Taxpayers' Alliance.